In the uh, years since our book was published, uh, there has probably been more research in brain and mind phenomena than ever in the history of the world. Yet going over this material, at least in summary, it is noticeable that very few really new conclusions have been reached. We know much more about the functional manifestation of mental energy than ever before. But as to the essential nature of that energy, as to the essential meaning of the classical terms uh, used in religion and philosophy to explain or to describe the basic facts of existence, in these areas, very little has actually been accomplished. I note one rather interesting trend that perhaps is worth mentioning. Uh, the tendency today to avoid the term consciousness in the preparation of a learned thesis. Uh, the tendency is to be afraid of the implication of that word. Also, that under this one term, we have grouped so large an area of specialized meanings that the term is no longer comprehensive or comprehensible in an effort to make a factual statement. <coughs> uh, this brings us, therefore, to one of the important areas of our discussion this evening. We are dealing with two chapters of our book relating to the brain and also relating to the symbolism that has survived for us concerning the power of the release of the consciousness at death. So let us try to be somewhat orderly and pay tribute where we can uh, to modern form and modern usage and begin with a study of consciousness. Now it is obvious that uh, this is a highly controversial field and we have no intentions of being dogmatic. Yet in all controversy, uh, the various aspects of a problem must be presented. We use the term consciousness in philosophy particularly to represent a very abstract principle, a principle of universal awareness, a universal state of which things have some nature of and in themselves, from which they are able to gradually evolve faculties and powers involving discrimination, thought, reflection, and memory. That these must exist as seed principles cannot be denied because we are able to observe the consequences of the growth of these seeds in the development of organized forms of life. We are aware, for example, of the existence of a vast archetypal pattern in the universe. This archetypal pattern indicates a plan or a purpose. And to plan and to purpose, these are aspects of the works of consciousness. Plans do not arise in the absence of cognitional principles. That which has no existence of itself cannot plan the existence of it of any other thing. Thus we come to a classical point as quickly as we can, namely that there exists everywhere in space, substance, and essence a universal animating power. 
that this animating power possesses among its attributes awareness and self-awareness. Awareness may be like the warm glow of a sunrise, self-awareness the light of the risen sun itself. We have every reason to suspect, and even science does not dare to erase this probability. We have every reason to suspect that the root of what we call consciousness is present in every molecular unit, in every cell, in every electron, and in modern terms, in every atom. That this atom, this unit, contains the potential power of awareness, and that what we commonly term the growth or unfoldment of life is made possible primarily through the continuous release of awareness in things. Thus as surely as man grows by the unfoldments of faculties and powers, so all these faculties and powers are dependent upon the, pres the presence of a suitable energy to sustain them, to vitalize them, to ensoul them with its own interior awareness power. We may liken our problem somewhat to the mystery of a telephone. Uh, the establishment of the phones and the wiring will not result in the possibility of communication unless an energy is also given to those wires by which they become capable of transmission. Thus, that energy must be present in practically all phenomenal activity of the universe. This energy, in various levels and in various ways, supports function, makes function possible and real, and supplies to every structural unit in nature an enlivening power. What is this power? Perhaps it is more convenient for us to uh, attempt to note its existence first in this way. This existence can be bestowed, and it apparently can be removed or withdrawn. The state of life seems to reveal to us the presence of this inner awareness energy. Uh, the loss of life, the condition of death, seems to reveal to us the departure or the cessation of this energy. Science would be the last to assume that energy is destructible. Therefore, what we would term death cannot be regarded as a destruction of energy. And by extension, we have a strong case in the favor of the fact that death cannot be regarded as an extinction of consciousness. Death, however, is a phenomenon involved in the relationship between consciousness and a medium of manifestation. Obviously, consciousness can fail to animate a form. And when energy involving consciousness totally departs from a form, that form disintegrates. And all of its activities upon the level of our consciousness will cease. Thus we have an energy or a form of life which by its presence activates all of the composite nature of a being. And by its absence or removal, causes the end of such activation, leaving that body or form inanimate, 
or reducing it to forms of activity far lower than that with which we are concerned in the study, study of consciousness. We must, however, be immediately aware that our term consciousness involving the principle of energy must be universal everywhere present and therefore can be understood as being present in forms of life lower than those of the human being as we know him. This brings us then to the next important problem. In man, we have what we call the brain. The question as to the relationship between the brain and consciousness has been a moot one for thousands of years. Man experiences the processes of mentation as occurring in his head. He senses or feels this. He senses it perhaps for real or perhaps for less valid reasons. Perhaps he senses it because so many of his sensory perceptions are grouped here. Perhaps he senses it because of the proximity of sight so that things seen appear to enter our natures through the head. Perhaps through the power of sound, it would appear that if nature wishes to establish the sensory instruments in as close proximity as possible to the centers with which they are associated, that the head must be in some distinct and definite manner closely associated with sensory processes and uh, the various functional and sensory uh, activities with which man is concerned. Now the problem as to where this process starts and how it starts seems to bring to us one immediate answer, namely that the brain is like any other instrument or machine composed of physical elements, that the brain is not a thinker, that the brain is not a mentally alive structure. The brain is a physical structure which can only be alive because life is communicated to it or that in some way its own structure captures or releases life. We know that this is true to a large degree through experiments in mental phenomena. We have become increasingly convinced that we must regard the brain as an area peculiarly responsible to the processes, uh, responsive to the processes of thought and mentation, that this area of structure must supply us with the most subtle parts of body, must supply us with the very subtle instruments, uh, such as those that we are now discovering in our researches in atomics and electronics, but that the brain itself is only able to think because of the presence of an energy. That it is the loss of this energy which prevents thought. It is the failure of this energy which makes thought impossible. And it is the ending of this energy which among other forms of consequence at death ceases as a medium for the expression of active mental processes. So we have brain and we have energy. And now we have to find out, if we can, the relationship between energy and brain. This causes us to come into consideration of a classical term, which perhaps uh, we need at this time and that is mind. What is the relationship between brain and mind? 
What is the relationship between mind and energy? We must assume that mind is a structure, whether we can see it or not, which is made active by the presence of mental energy. Just as the brain achieves its activity through the presence of physical or nervous energy. Therefore, the mind is not identical with the brain. Yet the mind, in our periods of living consciousness in this world, always manifests through the brain or in some way is associated with brain process. So we may say that the mind is a kind of overbrain, or a brain invisible, functioning through a visible structure. The Greeks would say that the mind is a form and the brain is a body. A form being a compound of energy and matter. In a compound more subtle, more attenuated than that of a body. So we may be dealing with a principle, and that principle is the principle of mind. Now how shall we understand this? Oriental philosophy, I think, gives us one of the clues to it. Mind is a form of the word, or an extension into our language, of the word manas, which in turn is a synonym in Sanskrit for the name or term for man. Man, manas. Therefore, the mind is a human instrument, peculiar and natural to that degree of evolutionary process which we call human. Mind is therefore a kind of body, invisible, but essentially rooted to the humanity of man. And this mind becomes, so to say, the overself, uh, the archetypal being. And according to most systems of philosophy that believe in the survival of an intelligent entity after death. It is this mental entity which survives. And it is the belief in many philosophical systems that the mental entity is the superior entity, and at least relatively speaking, the true entity. And that therefore this entity, by union with body, causes mental activity to be released through brain. This mental activity, as the term implies, includes the activity principle itself. Therefore, a mind is also a vitalized area. It is a subtle structure sustained by energy, even as the brain is a grosser structure also sustained by energy. Now it is reasonable and not difficult to, re to recognize that there must be and always have been degrees of relationships between various life forms in nature. We cannot assume the existence of space and then of man. Man must be bound to space by certain bonds and ties. Space moving in upon man must achieve union with man by means of a series of emanational forms or structures. Thus, between two very different forms of life, there must be intermediate forms, forms which partake of one or the other to some degree, but make of their own natures bridges across which energies can move. Pure energy, therefore, uh, striking the brain of man, might keep this brain alive, 
that would not bestow upon this brain any mental processes. It is therefore essential that consciousness or life or energy moving into the brain structure of man must first pass through a mental conditioning and that it is this mental structure which finally forms the tie between energy and brain. Therefore, mind is mentally conditioned energy. It is energy which has evolved into a mental integration. It is energy in its aspect of thought. And it is furthermore energy which as thought has created an instrument for its own expression, an invisible but real instrument, the instrument we know as mind. If this is then uh, a reasonable assumption, we can then explain or understand how mind, overshadowing brain, can cause brain to become an instrument for the release of mental processes. Now, in this procedure of mental process, what is mind, essentially? Is mind the same as consciousness? No. Mind is very obviously and definitely conditioned. Mind is not pure consciousness, nor is it pure life in any form. Mind is already life reduced to a mental equation functioning as a mental energy in an instrument suitable for such specialization of cosmic life power itself. Thus, mind is already a highly evolved, highly complex structure in which universal energy as, is manifesting itself as universal thought power. If we go on just a little further with this, we can then uh, see how it might well be that the mental entity or that part of the rational being uh, which is mental can have an existence apart from body, can be associated with it, can unfold and evolve through it, can depart from it, and in so doing, destroy the effectiveness of the brain, but in no way change or alter its own nature. Thus we come to a point which is gaining greater favor every day in scientific circles, namely that it is possible for a thought substance to exist apart from a material substance that mind can have a nature and existence of itself, and that its relationship to man is, therefore, a relationship of compound, and that all such compounds can be and must necessarily be dissolved at some time or another. This, then, gives us a scientific approach to the problem of a mental survival which is not dependent upon the continuance of a physical brain. But is this surviving mental nature going to be identical with the brain mental nature with which we are familiar? In other words, can a person drop the brain and still be the same kind of thinker that he was when he had a brain. Of course, this always assumes that he did some thinking while he had the brain, which may be open to some dispute. <laughs> some hope that he would, they will do better uh, without the brain than they have done with it. Some view the brain as a prison for already potential cosmic consciousness, and they can hardly wait to leave it behind. <laughs> Others less optimistic wonder if they are going to have any consciousness beyond the grave, 
and because of the brain-bound nature of their thinking while they are here, as they thought anything here that would be any use to them anywhere else. This is another important consideration. In this uh, somewhat uh, critical dilemma, uh, I think we may then ask, what is the essential function of, of mind? Is mind actually the thinker? Is mind a self-thinking instrument? Or is mind, in turn, only a conditioning instrument? Let us assume something which science thinks is rather good these days, namely that the brain finds itself extended throughout the entire physical body as the nervous system, that the nervous system is merely an extension of the brain, that theoretically, therefore, wherever there is a nerve filament, some form of brain function can be present. And that because all these filaments, like the telephone wire, have become vitalized by an energy, all of these filaments can communicate. And that any message sent over them will finally be deposited in the brain. As a result of this, the brain has two distinct functions in coordination with the nervous system. One is to receive the continuous battery of impulses. Impulses which coming along the nervous system reach various areas of, mental, of brain structure where they are specialized or where they are brought back into some relationship uh, with the original impulse. Obviously, when we touch an object, that object does not go into the nerve and reach the brain. We are not aware of a table because the nerve takes the table in there. We are aware of it because a series of impulses, much like the grooves of a recording, create a vibratory process which can be reassembled in the brain to reconstruct the table or any other object under consideration. Thus, there is constantly flowing into the brain the almost continuous battery of impulses, of things picked up or recorded by all parts of the nervous system. And for that matter, they, uh, these impulses can be picked up by a process of induction so that the object does not entirely have to even touch a nerve for the impression of that object to be recorded in the brain. This situation then is paralleled by the fact that through the nervous system, the brain is continually exercising executive control over function. By means of the brain, the hand obeys the thought. By means of the various centers in the brain, the body becomes a kind of instrument under the continuous control of a central coordinator. This uh, causes us to then try to decide the nature of consciousness in a little different way. Not having any good definition at hand, we suddenly discover we need two, that one will not even do it because we have two distinct processes under consideration. We have consciousness as vitalizer, which is probably its essential basic nature. Then we have consciousness as interpreter, or consciousness making things knowable or understandable. And these are entirely different processes. Therefore, we must assume that we are dealing with a kind of consciousness that is universal and which we experience only as the total fact of existence. 
then we are dealing with a conditioned consciousness, which we uh, experience in the terms of knowing and self-knowing. The generalized type of consciousness makes us alive. The more specialized type permits us to go to school and learn. And these two are not the same. One is a very much specialized and limited aspect of the other. The universal consciousness has infinite functions, uncountable and unknowable propensities, whereas personal consciousness is extremely limited. And as far as its own abilities are concerned, reflects from universal consciousness little more than energization or the power of its own existence. The rest is comparatively a result of lesser function. The brain being, as it were, the gateway to the mind becomes the intricate machinery by means of which sensation recorded by the peripheral nervous system and the sensory structure. Sensation is carried into the brain field and here a series of processes begin which end in the individual experiencing certain reactions certain inevitable processes. Thus, objective consciousness is the consciousness of the power to experience, the consciousness of the power to be aware of certain particular special happenings, all of these happenings within the field of awareness provided by the nervous system of the physical body. In speaking of consciousness, therefore, Buddha, rather pessimistically, describes what we call consciousness as nothing more nor less than the alchemical product of sensation. That the individual's mental life as we know it, his attitudes on all things, his feelings, his impressions, his convictions, his emotions, his thoughts, his reflexes, are all of them simply the byproducts of sensation entering the brain and finally coming into a state of coordination because of the existence of an invisible coordinator called mind. The mind is therefore the coordinator of sensation. The brain is the instrument for the recording of sensations. But the brain of itself cannot coordinate anything any more than one of these elaborate human or rather mechanical brains that we have devised lately it can in any way rationalize or be reasonable. Their function is left entirely to such processes as can be mechanically achieved. These may in turn or in time produce patterns that are highly indicative of facts, but unless man comes in and interprets the machine to his own purposes, its statistics are of comparatively no value. Certainly they are of no value to the machine itself. Therefore, in this process, man plays the coordinator and the machine plays the brain. This is perhaps as close to it as we can come in a common uh, everyday analogy. Considering this process then, we may say that what we call consciousness is a result of sensation entering in being coordinated and in the process of coordination being transformed from a series of impulses to a kind of compound idea or attitude. 
This attitude, in turn, moving back out through the nervous system, becomes the guide of conduct. Thus the individual, from his sensations, creates his attitudes. And by his attitudes, he directs his life. Now, the attitudes with which he directs life, in their turn, bring him into contact with new and different patterns of sensation. These, in turn, are carried back into the brain, arranged by the coordinator, and released as modifications of conduct. All this process of summing itself up in a simple statement of an individual, that is the way I thought it was yesterday. Today I have changed my mind. The only reason why we change the mind is because through the sensation and through the coordinating power of the brain, some new circumstance has been brought to our awareness, a circumstance which requires a modification of our previous state of awareness. Buddha carries this a little further and uses the wheel of the doctrine the Dharma Chakra, to represent this process. And all we have to do to see exactly what he meant is to assume that this wheel is one of the wheels in a squirrel cage. <laughs> that actually we continue to run and run and run and the wheel turns and we stay where we are. This process this cycle between the acceptance of sensation and the release of attitude, which in turn causing new sensational evidence, causes again modification of attitude. This process is the area in which the average individual's so-called alleged consciousness is locked. When he says, this I believe, he is speaking only from this sequence of sensation producing in its turn modification of the previous evidences of itself. When the individual says, this I am, his so-called I am-ness is merely the calculated conclusion of his mental coordinator concerning himself. It has nothing to do with that which is not to be sensed, examined, explored, or interpreted by this coordinator. Man looks into a mirror, sees his own likeness, and says, obviously, here I am. This is considered to be direct thinking. But the only reason he is able to say, here I am, is that a series of sensory testimonies have been carried to the brain. Cut these testimonies off so that the individual is aware neither of the mirror nor of himself and he cannot arrive at this conclusion any more than a person born totally blind can ever arrive at true color consciousness. It is only because of the faculties we possess and their use according to the laws governing these faculties themselves that we are able to come to certain definite conclusions about our own existence, the existence of other things, the past from which we came, the present in which we now live, and the future which we hope for. These things all exist because of the continuous cyclic interplay of sensation and uh, rationalization through mental alchemy. If this be more or less reasonable, and uh, there is much evidence to sustain it, particularly in the field of abnormal psychology, man remains today what he has always been, a being 
who does not know himself, who has no way of actually becoming aware of his own true nature. Because it is obvious that this true nature cannot be fully comprehended on the basis of the sensory cycle. Man cannot experience the invisible part of himself. He does not know how. It will not be discernible to any sensory perception. And for lack of this ability to capture it within the net of the five senses, the individual cannot know about it. Therefore, what we term speculation on these subjects is merely the pressing of the familiar along back toward the unfamiliar. It is the imposing of the world of senses upon the unseen universe that cannot be comprehended. Therefore, we merely project our physical thinking into space and call it metaphysics. This is what it essentially amounts to. It is our own pattern that simply seeks for solution by the rarification of its own accepted processes. We see this in the study of all primitive culture, where God emerges as king, merely the extension of the tribal chieftain. Always deity is the hero or the chieftain or the patriarch we have known plus. And this plus is achieved in our heart by putting a halo around his head. It's the best we can do with it. But when we put the halo around his head, we tell everyone the explanation of the halo, and it becomes a word. And this word says, I am not human. I am superior to that which is human. Thus we uh, put wings on angels. Not because we've ever seen any with real feathers, but because we wish it to be known that we are not dealing with literal human beings. And not knowing how to draw an angel in proper person, we draw the most attractive human being that we can, and then make it an angel by the adding of wings, much as the Mayas made a verb out of a noun by also adding a wing to signify energy. So we are pushing these sensory conclusions backward, and we are trying continuously to penetrate the unknown by the brute force and awkwardness of, s of sensory intensity. But we are brought for the reason that the mental coordinator cannot coordinate that which the senses do not bring in. The mental coordinator has no existence apart from the process of coordination itself. So we experience it because we use it. If it was not used, it would vanish from our awareness and we would not know that it exists. Thus we have now the brain, and we recognize the tremendous mystery of this structure. We realize that in many respects it is one of our most valuable possessions. It is an instrument created almost like a television or a radio, by means of which we can tune in of the processes of mental energy by which man is able to solemnly and seriously declare that he is a thinking being. This thinking being the executive leadership of the mind over the testimonies of the sensory perceptions. Facts, therefore, as we think of them scientifically, are bound very closely to sensory perceptions. The scientist doubts that which the physical faculties cannot sustain, and as far as he can go, he uses them. Where he cannot use these, he uses the scientific processes of mathematics to substitute symbols for facts, 
and to call upon the highest available resources of the mental coordinator. If this thinking has some value in, uh, in principle, and it seems to come the nearest to any solution that we know, we can then say what is the pure nature of mind itself as separated from brain. If the individual is to step out of the brain, what happens to him? The first thing that must inevitably happen, of course, is that any form of sensation dependent upon the brain and the nervous system must be blocked or cut off. The individual is no longer, therefore, able to experience this mysterious cycle of the Dharma Chakra. He is no longer able to uh, defend his sensations with his mental coordinator or express his mental coordination through his sensory functions. Thus he becomes, so to say, separated from a sphere of activity in which the brain is the one and only link. Consequently, the phenomenal universe as he knows it must cease to exist. Aye, but there's one other factor. And that other factor is that among the mental coordinating factors that have been brought out by this process through evolution is a power of retention. Therefore, it is true likewise that the individual is continually building a mental image Without this mental image, the value of sensation and reflex would be comparatively nil. The individual would have the perfect capacity to make the same mistake a million times and never even know that he did it. It is only by use of the retentive faculty that thoughts remind us of previous experiences. All previous experiences are retained to become, in a sense, sensors of a new testimony. This procedure then tells one other thing, that if the sensory area is blocked by the loss of the body, by brain disease, or by any other circumstance which renders the brain function impossible, then the mind still has a mental existence of its own, an existence in an area of things remembered, an internal existence. Now, as far as that is concerned, would such an internal existence be any different as far as the mental pattern is concerned than it would be if we still had the brain and the sensory function here. Actually, the world around us does not enter into us. The world around us simply becomes the basis of these experiences, which carry along the lines of the sensory perceptions, become organized in the mind into images, ideas, and patterns. Consequently, the power of the mind to image is not destroyed by the loss of the body. The only thing that is lost is the power to receive continual physical stimulus, which might rapidly or dramatically change or modify the brain's imagery. Buddhists make a great point of this in connection with the after-death state and in the use of their great uh, religious ritual of the bardo, the equivalent of the Egyptian ritual of the dead. The concept here being that the mind can retain the imagery of its own processes and will retain the estate which it has achieved by the interpretation of sensory phenomena and that this will continue and will uh, survive and will ultimately be capable of informing a new body.
so that the individual's mental life can be transferred one from one form to another. And being so transferred, it retains that degree of judgment or coordination which it has previously attained. And when the new brain is available, it simply continues to receive further stimuli and to coordinate these in terms of its own attainment until finally the brain theoretically can attain to the full possession of this mental process. So that in certain persons of apparently great wisdom, the brain seems to be superior to that of the average individual. Actually, however, the evolution of brain process is merely a shadow of the evolution of mental integration. It is the mind that ensouls the brain that is the growing structure. The brain only can achieve a continuing refinement of organic quality so that the mind may function more accurately through it and receive information more completely and rapidly from the sensory reflexes. This ends in what many Eastern philosophies have believed in the peculiar blind end of the mind gradually gaining an estate of itself, so that there is a kind of immortality conferred by mentation, and that the mind theoretically as an entity can go on growing experiencing through a sequence of brains which it inhabits until finally the mental being attains a very high degree of refinement, a very high degree of skill in estimating phenomena. But all the way through, even in its most reflective moods, the mind still retains its essential problem that of dependency upon sensation for the stimulation of its resources. Now, how then can we identify or separate mind uh, from mental brain phenomena? How are we to discover the nature of mind as it is? This was one of the reasons for the development of the theory of contemplative or meditative discipline. It was the belief of ancient peoples that the mental entity uh, could best be experienced in its own nature by the gradual reduction of the influence or pressure of brain sensation stimulation. Thus, in quietude, in the gradual attainment of discrimination, in the reduction of the intensity of sensory existence, it became evident that less and less phenomenon, less and less phenomena would be communicated to the mental entity. Theoretically, if the mental entity during life reaches a certain degree of relaxation in which it is no longer forced to interpret phenomena, the individual, the mystic, has come to the conclusion that it is possible then that he might be able to experience the laws of mind, whereas now he can experience only the laws of brain. If the mind has an existence apart from the body, then it has an existence of itself, which is not to be merely the shadowed uh, reflection of physical circumstances, and the mind having its own mental life can produce a kind of mentation in which the laws of mind, the laws of the mental state of knowing, which are best expressed in the concept of reason or the concept of true judgment or the concept of abstract creative mentation, 
these processes uh, come to the individual who is, ma who is able to break the continual tyranny of sensation, which bombarding the mental equipment all the time forbids the mind to express its own nature, but permits it only to express the reflex of our own purposes. As this procedure goes along, the mystic holds very strongly to the conviction that the mind processes, as they relax and become unconditioned by environment pressure, begin to develop these capacities which we associate with the mystical experience or some higher uh, divine state of being. Beyond the mind remains the unsolved mystery of consciousness itself. The brain is personal. The mind is individual. Consciousness is universal. And the bridge between mind as universal and consciousness is as yet extremely dim to us, although it seems that at certain times a flash of pure consciousness does become available. More likely, however, it is still conditioned, but being better than we have previously had seems as though it is pure divinity itself. Consciousness in Eastern philosophy is the exact opposite of consciousness as we know it objectively. Therefore, in terms of the experience sensation processes of brain and mind, True consciousness is conceived of only as a vacuum, only as that which is not mentation, that which is not brain or sensation reflex. If we want to study this matter uh, further, we can gain a great deal of consolation, as I have noted in the book, from the study of various parallel systems of world religion and philosophy. The world has always recognized uh, that in some way the brain had to do with the great processes of manifestation. The great triad in the body of man, corresponding to the three persons of the Godhead, was the heart, the brain, and the reproductive system. These represented the three great life centers without which the function of the human being would be impossible. It was the opinion of the ancients that what we term now as energy or pure life has its polarization in the human heart, and that from this polarization the energy is communicated to the brain by which it is activated. Therefore, that the source, the dynamo, the reservoir of energy in man is brought in and manifested through the heart center. That this in turn is then distributed throughout the body and a specialized aspect of it becomes polarized in the brain and the other or negative aspect becomes polarized in the reproduction of the species. This balance of energy would then cause us to assume that if we could go deeper than the brain in search of a center for our consciousness, that we would turn and must turn to the heart. That the heart, therefore, lies behind the manifestation of energy which we know as brain mental energy. If, therefore, a superior nature possesses the brain with its mind. It possesses the heart with its consciousness. And the heart is to the consciousness what the brain is to the mind. This consciousness the ancients called spirit. And they therefore assumed that the spirit had its abode in the heart. The soul, which included the entire psychic nature, in the brain, and the energy or vitality 
in the great generative complex of nerves. In this way, a triad was established. And we can then continue, perhaps even with the thought from the Bible, as a man in his, uh, thinketh in his heart, so is he. That behind mind is this heart complex, through which the consciousness of a being manifests and becomes the total possessor of body. And as the complete autocrat then permits the polarization of its own purpose in the brain as the mental focus. Now it is reasonably obvious uh, that during the processes of life the brain is active. That this activity has what we have suggested as this kind of round-robin process. This process of the wheel turning. And uh, then we come to the uh, problem of how the mind is associated with the brain. Does the mind impose itself completely on the brain? Does the mind envelop the brain? Does the mind hide itself in certain cells of the brain? Uh, is the mind lurking in the mysterious ventricular openings of the brain? This was the more common thought of the ancient. He held definitely that the most attenuated part of the brain must be the part which links it to the next superior and still more attenuated energy. Therefore, that in all probabilities there might be within the brain itself no cell, no physical unit, which could be appropriately used as a pole for the mental principle. If, therefore, there is any, uh, the ancients made a rather subtle use of the old story of the tabernacle in the wilderness, in which they divided the wanderer's temple of the Jewish tribes in the wilderness into its three parts, the court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, declaring these three parts to represent, in a sense, the parts of man's body. That within the body itself, within the area of the body, there were two principal rooms. The holy place, which was the body as an instrument, and the holy of holies, which was the cranium, or the skull. And that this was, as the Greeks said, attached to the body by an isthmus called the neck. I think that's a rather nice way of saying it. An isthmus. Uh, we all know how it would sound if someone said, well, I have a pain in the isthmus. This, uh, uh, it might also be a good way of putting a certain well-known phrase in case uh, you are having social difficulties. Uh, in any event, within the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant consisted of these two cherubs, kneeling upon the surface of a great chest-like box. Uh, the cherubs faced each other, and their wings met overhead. And the space beneath their wings was called the mercy seat. And it was here, between the wings of the cherubs, uh, that the Shekinah's glory, or the presence of the Lord, was made manifest. The Shekinah's glory did not appear in the box, nor did it take over either of the cherubs, nor did it have an image of its own, for no image was permitted of it. It appeared in a space between these cherubs, whose meeting wings above resembled very closely the structure of the two hemispheres of the forebrain. Within this space, inside, 
the brain. Overshadowed by these two great brain lobes is a series of ventricles, on which perhaps the most commonly referred to and best known is the third ventricle. It is in this ventricular space also that we find the location of the two great ductus glands of the brain, the pineal and the pituitary body. In the ancient beliefs, uh, Albertus Magnus held this opinion, so did the great artist Leonardo da Vinci. It was the common belief of the great Arab physicians and scholars of older time that in some mysterious way, this ventricular opening, this hollow place, this room, this secret abode of the Most High, this wonderful palace built upon the Palatine Hill, the palate being the upper part of the mouth, that here we have the place where the superior principle, in this case the mental principle, has its closest possible relationship with the body. Now, in order for this relationship to exist, it is inevitable and necessary, therefore, that this um, ventricular space be not empty, but rather be in a continual state of vibration, that a golden mist, or, as was sometimes referred to in the old writings, a kind of dew of heaven. That this uh, actually had to fill this ventricle. And that in this mysterious glow or light, the Shekinah's glory, which in all probabilities is the original of the halo around the head, that in this light field, the next superior part impinged itself upon the brain. And that in this way, it was continually exercising a very subtle influence. And uh, into this area, according to the older beliefs, the sensations poured. And in this area, they were coordinated. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, in one of his wonderful drawings of the cross-section of the human brain, he anticipated Vesalius slightly, but did not carry the point as far as this great anatomist. Uh, in one of his drawings, following earlier custom, of course, Leonardo labels the central ventricular orifice of the brain the place of the community of the senses. He calls this, of course, where the senses are in common. And, of course, we preserve the term by saying common sense. That this is the field of the common sense in man. Well, now we all realize the field is in a sad state of decrepitude at the present moment, but that perhaps something could be done to reclaim it. The common sense, in this case, does not mean judgment that agrees with the masses. <laughs> common sense means a place where these various processes meet in some common ground, a coordinating area. And Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas were both of the opinion that it was in this central area this central ventricular space that all confusion and discord concerning sensory perception had to be arbitrated, and that out of this arbitration came reasonable opinion or attitudes that were themselves common sense or arising from the common testimony of all senses. Now, if we use that definition today, who would claim common sense? Who could say common sense if it meant that it was a common and honest union of the testimony of all senses 
opinions, attitudes, beliefs, and desires. That therefore common sense was as near as we can attain to the truth of the matter, because all of the elements of the matter have been honestly estimated and fitted together into their most reasonable pattern. This automatic process is said to go on continuously. But with the possibility of the mental impingement being therefore in the field of this energy, we can say what kind of energy are we now dealing with? The answer most likely is the field of the nervous energy of the body. For it is into this as into a reservoir that must pour all of the sensations which have been uh, gathered by the nervous system, specialized and put back into semblance of reasonable appearance or reasonable coordination by the brain structure itself, and then dispatched to this central region for interpretation, for classification, and for judgment upon the matter. The brain does not judge. The brain turns it all over to the mysterious oracle that abides in the shadow of the Most High. And therefore, as the priest of the ancient tabernacle rites entered into the Holy of Holies to there ask the will of God in all matters, so we may say uh, that the brain, to achieve the interpretation of sensory testimony, which it has assembled, must for this purpose call upon a power superior to itself. And this superior to itself power is present because of the impingement of the mental nature upon this sensitized area, which is a highly specialized electromagnetic field within the brain. If this is assumed out of ancient symbolism to be not an unreasonable conclusion. We may then suspect that there is a reason for the very subtle membrane which is curiously placed in this area, a membrane which could have a function of almost a god ear. Just as the eardrum is responsive to certain vibration, so this mysterious curtain in the third ventricle could very well be the mysterious uh, drum, the mysterious uh, subtle substance by means of which the vibration agitation could be set up. Therefore, that the actual communication is in terms of vibration made possible through the very rapid motion of this uh, drum-like membrane in the field of energy. We are not able to dogmatize these things because science simply has not been able to explore this matter. But it would follow immediately that if this field is composed of this rarefied form of energy distilled from the nerve processes of the body and therefore carrying in it, as in the air, a radio program is carried, the various testimonies set up by sensory perception, it would then, of course, immediately follow that if for any reason this magnetic field of body energy is cut off, that immediately the available energy in this glandular field or in this ventricular field would also be cut off. Under such conditions, this field would suddenly become negative. It would simply no longer be a field of energy. It would become a vacuum. This would immediately cut off the possibility of the mind operating upon these energies, and the mind's relationship to the body and to brain function would be lost. Also, it is quite obvious 
that at death all such energy fields would cease as far as the body is concerned. Consequently, the moment these energies ceased, there could no longer be a rational collect connection between the mind and the brain field. The mind would not necessarily have to depart anywhere any more than it would be necessary for the broadcasting station to move every time we wanted to turn off a program. The power to turn off and on the program rests with the person. But when the vibratory polarities, which make possible the tuning in of the program, are broken or lost, then the program simply ceases to exist as far as that particular instrument is concerned. As this is a living program, as this is a program of energy in function, it would inevitably follow also that under these circumstances, mental processes uh, could not survive anything which damages the magnetic field in the brain or any process relating to it. What happens if this energy field becomes comparatively free from all impulse impact? Let us assume, for example, what happens in sleep. Here we have a very good example of our problem. In the process of sleep, sensation is no longer actively carried to the brain. The sensory perceptions are either totally ineffective or largely suspended. Consequently, all of the five sensory testimonies upon which we depend uh, for awareness itself, not only awareness of meaning, but awareness of object, these have been suspended. And under normal conditions, the result is the complete suspension of the coordinating power. In sleep, therefore, the mysterious energies in the ventricular orifice are no longer conveying any sensation or any adequate sensation. As a result of that, the brain coordinator is not called into function. The mind is not involved because there is nothing for it to work upon. And the result is unconsciousness as we know it. Unconsciousness is therefore, for our physical living, directly associated with the suspension of function. If we suspend the five senses, we are asleep, which means we are unaware of anything. Thus, that which we call brain awareness comes from the outside, not from the inside. For we have no way of assuming or suspecting that mind sleeps. For it is said in the scripture, the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And that is the same power that was between the wings of the cherub. What happens, however, is that mind, separated from the pressure of brain stimulus simply returns to its own native state. And that native state cannot be consciously experienced by the brain. This uh, then leads us to the problem of the release of the psychic life from the body, part of which I think we've already clarified in the process of going along but which we want to try to fit now into a more condensed picture. According to most of the ancient thinkers, and most of our Eastern thinkers also, what we call objective or human physical consciousness awareness is essentially distributed throughout the body and throughout all areas nourished by the nervous system. It therefore means that essentially man's physical body is physically conscious in all its parts. Part of this consciousness, however, is not understandable or acceptable by man, inasmuch 
as the gamut of human interpretation is limited. And as man ascends uh, the uh, ladder of evolutionary mental specialization, he must leave off one by one the lower rungs. He can no longer share in the consciousness of the primordial atom. He can no longer actually share in the consciousness of the evolving creatures through whose life principles he himself has passed. Because he cannot, again, escape from the actual boundaries of his processes. And man is man. Therefore, his consciousness is involved in the relationship between his brain and a mental energy or a mental being of human estate. Therefore, he cannot escape from this area of consciousness. It would naturally follow, therefore, that man's body might be conscious in all its parts, but man have only a general consciousness of his body. He is aware of it, but he certainly cannot experience any longer uh, the, the frustrations and neuroses of single cells. They are no longer available to his awareness, but we have no reason to doubt that any cell in the body of man can suffer, because the way we treat the body is enough to be very discouraging even to the best adjusted cell. In any purpose, however, of the moment, uh, the ancients held that in the process of death, energies were not lost but that the energies of the body slowly moved backward along the nerve threads. And as the nerve threads uh, lost their energization and all the processes of circulation ceased, the first parts of the body to disintegrate would be the extremities or those areas furthest from the life center. Finally, all of these energies would converge toward the heart. And in the heart, they would build themselves a kind of sanctuary in what the old Buddhist councils called the Septapana Cavern, or the Cave of Seven Rooms, which is the heart. After the coordination of these processes within the heart structure itself, the processes of death then consisted of the motion of the heart center, which in this case represents the polar uh, focus of the conscious being itself. That this heart center then moved up the pneumogastric nerve into the brain. And that in the brain, it then gathered up all of the energies and resources of the mental life, continuing on its journey, passing out of the rear top of the skull into the atmosphere of space from which it came. And researchers have indicated that the body may show warmth at the crown of the head after it is not to be found elsewhere. And, of course, the tonsure or the shaving of the head, the mysterious ornaments and decorations worn by priests of antiquity, the ornaments and symbols associated with death, as, for example, down in our own southwest, the placing of an inverted bowl over the head at the time of burial, but always with a small hole knocked in the bottom of the bowl so that the soul could escape. These symbols seem to go back to archetypal convictions. Once the body has uh, proven that it can no longer sustain the consciousness or is no longer able to function adequately, the processes of deterioration in the body close in upon the functioning of these areas or fields. And as a result, these fields cease to animate. And as soon as the energy in these fields cease, ceases, the superphysical principle can no longer retain relationship with the body to which it was previously connected. 
Therefore, it is actually the body that closes the door. It is the body which no longer provides these fields or these areas. And the principles operating on the body or through the body or in the body gather themselves into their own sources and gradually depart. In departing, we simply mean that they cease to have conscious connection with the body. The body is then no longer theirs. It no longer is aware of them. And in only by interior, interior imagery is it, is it or the consciousness aware of the body. Although there appears to be some evidence of temporary sympathetic relationships between the magnetic fields and the body. These relationships, however, are normally very brief. The uh, failure of these fields has simply made it impossible for the superior nature, so to say, to continue to impinge upon the body. Therefore, the body is no longer a channel for its energies. And as its own energies are not adequate to maintain it, the body then disintegrates. This means, of course, uh, that in the old philosophies, that the problem of the state of the consciousness, apart from the body, was of supreme symbolic importance. Knowing that such severance must occur, we remember how Buddha in the Dhammapada, or the last great discourse, uh, describes the situation of his own decease. How he achieved the liberation of the superior from the inferior by a conscious process of meditation that he qu quietly, gently, and wisely led the mind and the superior parts of the nature out of the body when the body had become so sickened that it was no longer able to support him. He therefore, uh, uh, to a measure, quietly, voluntarily uh, achieve the processes of death by intention, and in this way quietly departed from the body. In his departure from the body, he indicated his knowledge of the great uh, yoga chakra concept of ancient India, the power to control and direct the various fields of energy and to make possible various stages of specialized relationship between the body, the mind, and the being behind the mind. Uh, in the light of our discussion last week, I think we shall then be implying that the relationship of, of this twofold evolutionary process is involved also in this situation. Bodies, through the processes of growth, growth being the achieved refinement of bodies through the experiencing by reflex of the achievements of the mind inhabiting them. The mind leading the body can imply for that body an increasing participation in good. It can counsel the moderation of all practices. It can search into the secrets of health. It can also uh, gradually overcome the principal enemies of the body, which are not physical circumstances but psychic stress. Thus the body, uh, in the service of the enlightened mind, becomes itself permeated with higher and higher vibratory nerve energy rates. And these gradually result in the increasing refinement of the body. And as the body is composed of substances, the continual evolution of substance is attained by its continual incorporation into structures dominated by superior intelligence. Thus, the evolution of substance is attained by it being built into bodies and coming into continuous contact with higher forms of mentation, just in the same way that the lower animal kingdoms 
through constant association with man, have in some cases become domesticated, and in some cases again highly intelligent, highly sensitive, and apparently very little less than man in their capacity to sense, understand, appreciate, and value. Thus, by association, things become better or worse according to that with which they associate. And bodies associating with mind and vitalized by consciousness have their own cellular structures energized. Their own atoms vibrate more rapidly. And in this way, the entire mass of substance is gradually refined and therefore capable of providing ever more adequate vehicles or ever better bodies in the sense that these bodies are more sensitive. Now, the more sensitive the body, the greater the demands upon the regulation of that body. For it is obvious that a more sensitive body, like a more highly bred animal, will be subject to more infirmities, cannot be as easily abused, uh, cannot be neglected without the gravest results. Primitive bodies can stand much abuse. The highly civilized person cannot. There are cases of warriors in North Africa who have walked 15 miles with a bullet in their hearts. They did not even drop in their tracks. No ordinary Western person could accomplish this phenomenon due to the much greater psychic and structural sensitivity of our bodies. This means, of course, that the body is more easily sickened, that the relations between, between mind and body become more subtle, that there is ever greater danger of psychological, emotional, and mental disease where the principles and laws governing the balance and interrelationship of parts are broken or neglected. Thus the body in its refinement becomes something that must be watched and guarded with increasing caution. For a body of lower organic quality may recover from psychic hurt in a few hours or feel practically no pain, whereas another person with the same psychic hurt may be damaged for the rest of their lives. This increasing sensitivity is part of the evolution of matter or substance itself, which is merely in reality a lesser degree of energy or a less evolved degree of energy, which must in turn evolve also, so that the smallest cell in the body becomes the potential universe of the infinite future. In thus uh, depending upon uh, man or the total being for the evolution of their own parts, uh, structures uh, contribute their own part to the manifestation of the total being. This total being is held together archetypally by the pattern of species, the archetype of man being the celebrated Adam Kodman of the ancient Kabbalistic mysteries. There is, however, a mental archetypal being or person, and there is one of still higher nature. But this evolutionary process from brain, which is the most particular, to mind, which is the most analytical, then goes on beyond this to the mysterious X, which we like to refer to as consciousness, but which we must never confuse with the personal consciousness arising in our brain-mind chemistry. This other consciousness, this consciousness of the other side of existence, referred to in Buddhism as the consciousness of the far shore of life. This we are not able to adequately define. There seems to be no area in our own psychoglandular structure that can tune this in. The only possibility, therefore, lies in the situation of the relationship of mind with its own superior. There is no uh, consolation in the relationship between mind and its inferior, the body. 
If mind can be completely cleared of body as a psychic pressure, the ancients then believed that the mind's function would be suspended to the degree that the primary impulse of consciousness would become discernible. This would be equivalent to the Tao of Lao Tzu. Tao being the universal motion. The Lao Tzu believed motion to be true consciousness. And that the universal motion is a qualitative motion of life from itself to itself. Therefore, that involutionary consciousness is life seeking the expression of itself. Evolutionary consciousness is life seeking the rediscovery of unity with its own cause. And that consequently, if consciousness has any quality about it, it is a hunger for the complete expression of its own nature. That the end of consciousness is to draw everything back into its own totality, and in so doing to expand its own totality over all things. This is the double process, the process of nature growing up toward totality, and totality moving into nature producing the two mysterious interlocked figures of the yang and the yin in Chinese symbolism. So these two striving end finally in the re-identification of the consciousness factor per se. What this is, uh, no one has yet been able uh, to define adequately, because it is a consciousness not of this world or pertaining to conditions in this world, or as to the state of man's soul while he is in this world, or to any good or evil that may befall him in this world. The true nature of consciousness apparently is a situation or a condition of total awareness of total self. This is not possible during the conditioned existence in which we live. I would feel that in the next ten years, science might make some very helpful and perhaps positive uh, discoveries. If they would approach certain matters, perhaps first by faculties they least desire to use, and to realize, for example, that in matters pertaining to true mind, science as we know it is inadequate. Science is the science of the brain. Philosophy is the science of the mind. Religion is the science of consciousness. These things have to be approached on their own levels, and there is no possible way of moving the lower up to become the critic of the higher. Our next immediate problem in the growth of the average human being is further knowledge and further understanding of the relation of the mental coordinator to brain function. To achieve this knowledge, <coughs> it seems to me that we have to apply to reason. That we are going to find this knowledge in areas of psychological folklore. We're going to find this record not in cell structure. We are going to find it primarily in the products of the mentation process itself. In other words, our study of thinking must involve a research into thought itself, particularly into the products of primordial thought or the products of such types of thought as are of the purest and least adulterated kind, thoughts in which the brain factor is the least emphasized. Perhaps, therefore, we would find much more of this process of true study of mind if we studied the very young, in whose processes 
confusion has not yet generally entered. We may also come upon very valuable information if we will begin to realize the importance of analogy, the recognition that we can estimate certain unseen procedures by a further study of certain manifestations of these procedures which can be seen. But if we deny the possibility of a mental entity, we are going to destroy the possibility of discovering the mental fact. Our principal stumbling block has been the reluctance of the Western thinker to assume that intelligence can exist apart from matter. It has to, because actually intelligence in free space has always controlled matter. And it is also possible that what we call matter is no more nor less than a negative condition of intelligence. It is therefore impossible for us to assume that intelligence is limited to the brain. We can study enough microorganisms to know now that there are indications of definite intelligence in forms in nature in which no brain structure can be discovered. Therefore, while certain types of highly specialized intelligence require brain, there is no proof that, my, that mind and brain must be considered identical, or that mind must perish with brain, or that mind is generated with the physical development of brain. This is the big stumbling block today. And unless we get past that, we are never going to find uh, the real solutions to how and why we think. We are going to then ultimately be forced to the recognition that what we call the pure energy of mind, while it exists, is not essentially physical. It clothes itself in physical nerve energy. But this other energy is not identical with nerve energy, even as the wire of the telephone is not identical with the electricity that goes across it or through it. Thus, in our search, we must recognize that the mental energy is contributed to the brain and that also it can, in turn, deprive the brain of its existence by taking itself away from the brain. That the mind is in almost certainly, is in a condition to exist without the brain. But the brain is not in exist a condition to exist without the mind. The inferior must always depend upon the superior. But that which is superior can never be completely held, bound, or dominated by an inferior. Therefore, if the mind is superior to the brain, it is not subject to the law of the brain, nor is it subject to death with the brain. But having its own existence, it can have a free life in space, where, as a mental entity, it can continue its evolution, continue its growth, and in time, re-overshadow or come again into embodiment. And what we call ourselves, Joe Smith and Joe Dokes, we are really this mental energy vortex, uh, growing up under the testimony and instruction of the sensory reflexes, and naturally obligated to continue this instruction, so long as the material sphere is instructive to us. But having reached a point, a condition, in which this material sphere is no longer instructive, we must either assume that the man who knows everything simply drops dead, or else we must assume that the man who knows everything takes his knowledge and goes other places where he can learn, if possible, 
on another level where he has not learned everything that there is to know. It is therefore quite reasonable to assume that that which is gathering information has a reason, and that the tremendous processes of nature are not so organized that man will store away in his brain the experiences of a lifetime and then lose all of this as a result of a stroke, or that he will put away carefully all this valuable information, regularly and properly filed, and then depart into nothingness, so that the brain with all the records uh, fall into one grand and glorious decay. This cannot be regarded as essential. But we have this point. Assuming that the mind does carry these records, is the record of what it does here invaluable to the mind that is not here? I think it is for this reason. If the mind departing from here, departed from here to everywhere in one step, then the chances are that this information so carefully garnered would be of no value. But if this mind having a vast curriculum uh, to achieve, a mind in which there must be periodic re-embodiments in order to attain its ultimate supremacy over the laws and phenomena of the objective universe. If such is the natural plan, and it seems to be, or else there would be no reason for creation whatsoever, if this is true, that there is a reason, then the possession of mentally remembered facts would become of the greatest validity in assisting the individual in the direction of future conduct when he has again attained a brain. Now, it is also perfectly possible that when he attains this brain, and permeates it with his own mental energy, that this brain will then, to a large measure, be vitalized and will become the continuing function of his own mental purpose. There is only one catch in this, and that is that when he comes to find a new brain, he must find a brain suitable to the degree of evolution which he has attained. If this is not achieved, then, of course, naturally and obviously, he cannot uh, make maximum use of his problem, of his achievement. It being known that brain must grow, and that gradually mind must take hold of brain in order to bring it finally into coordination with its own purposes, we then have every evidence that it is only after a number of years, years which we now say precede the period of maturity or adulthood or majority, that until this time has been reached, the mind carrying its own purposes has not yet completely become accustomed to a brain, achieved a rapport with it that is satisfactory and is able then to continue the growth where it left off. Up to this time, the new, uh, the new inhabitant of the brain, not being adjusted, the control and direction of that brain must still be parental or social. And the individual is not regarded as self-responsible until the mind has become comfortably oriented in the brain, capable of using it, and capable of directing the flow of mental energy through the nervous system. These facts present, perhaps, the only solution uh, that can explain purposefully a series of mysterious circumstances uh, with which, without purpose, are amoral, completely meritless, and condemn the individual to a purposeless existence. 
Man rejects this because he cannot live with it. And in the course of years, the next step, I feel certain, is the final recognition of men of science and of learning that this mental thing which we call ourselves is capable of independent existence as existed before and will exist again, and that what we call life is merely an incident in a great curriculum of educational awareness by means of which mind conquers matter and by so doing restores matter to identity with itself. And matter gradually refining finally becomes identical with mind. And by this process, as the ancient mythologies tell us, the entire level of function is raised from a level of matter to a level of mind. When this is achieved, of course, the next step will be the gradual absorption of mind into the substance of consciousness. These processes continue. Where they begin, our consciousness, as we have it today, cannot tell us. Where it will end, we have no way of knowing. But unless we recognize a valid and rational plan we will never have the social, ethical, moral incentives to improve our world, and we will never understand evolution as a means of advancing the total good of humanity. Time's up.